Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Teresa Gans, Assistant Professor of Visual Art, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest today, um, whose work has long been a source of excitement and inspiration to me. Um, I want to thank the Visual Art Department and the Brown Arts Initiative for their generous support um, of our vi visiting artists program. Before we start, please take a minute to silence your cell phones. Um, and I also want to remind you about a couple of lectures in this series. We have Michelle Grabner, artist and curator, coming on Wednesday, November 2nd at 5 p.m. And Ramel Ross, um, professor of practice here at Brown on November 16th, same time, same place. We hope to see you there. Um, information about these events and others can be found on our department website under visiting artists or by subscribing to the list list emails. Um, I also want to let you know that after the lecture, there will be a question and answer period, and there are um, microphones here and here, so if you would come up to the mics to ask your questions, then we, everyone will be able to hear. Thank you. So, Abelardo Morel was born in Havana, Cuba in 1948. He immigrated to the United States with his parents in 1962. Morel received his undergraduate degree in 1977 from Bowdoin and MFA from Yale University of Art in 1981. And this is a little bit abbreviated, but his publications include a photographic illustration of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, A Camera in a Room by Smithsonian Press, A Book of Books, and Camera Obscura by Bullfinch Press, and a monograph, Abelardo Morel, published by Phidon. Recent publications include a limited edition by the Museum of Modern Art in New York of his cliché vert images with a text by Oliver Sacks. His work has been collected and shown in many galleries, institutions, and museums, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney, um, the Metropolitan, the Chicago Art Institute, San Francisco Museum of Art, Houston Museum of Art, Boston Museum of Fine Art, Victoria and Albert, and 70 other museums in the United States and abroad. A retrospective of his, of his work organized jointly by the Art Institute of Chicago, the Getty, and the High Museum in Atlanta closed in to May 2014 after a year of travel. In October 2014, Abelardo had his first show at the Edwin Hoke Gallery in New York, featuring a selection of new pictures. In 2015, Abelardo had a show at Bowdoin College, uh, Bowdoin College Art Museum entitled Mind of Winter. So that's just a short selection of what he's been doing over the years. Um, so I want you to join me in thanking Abelardo Morel. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Are we on? Yeah, yeah good. Uh, can we get the lights down? I hate lights on me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, even this. There's a saying in, in, in theater, uh, I don't know who said it, but it was apropos, uh, love the art in you, not you in the art. Uh, and I do follow that. Um, this is what's interesting. I'm not. Uh, so I have a, a, a series of pictures I want to show you from kind of way back to, and I like to brag about this, to a picture I made yesterday. Uh, uh, whether it's any good, that's a different question, but I made it yesterday. Um, and it has a kind of a road map, uh, I think, but if you have any questions uh, about it, you can ask later. So, um, okay, so this is me and my wife back in 1976. This is 40 years old. Um, I went to school, uh, MFA in photography, uh, when it was, I guess, in mode to make pictures like Winogrand and Robert Frank and Helen Levitt and Dion Arbus and people who I love. Uh, so I kept making those pictures. They were not exactly original. They were copies of those people. But when Lisa and I met, well, this is what happened. Um, this is 1986. We had, uh, there we go, a baby. Uh, 
our son Brady. And later on, we had Laura, my daughter. But to me, uh, it's, it's uh, these events that really shaped uh, my sense of, of uh, being an artist. I think I became more who I was, who I should have been. Uh, it's part of, I think, being a father, perhaps, and a, and a husband. And it made me think about making photographs in a different way than I had been used to. Instead of street pictures, I began to make pictures in the house of these very boring moments that became really interesting because I did try to behave as if I was a baby myself, looking from the ground up. And it, it opened up a new sense of uh, vistas that I found very instructive. You know, if you're standing up, that world is one world. If you're on the ground, it's a different world. And photography is so much, so good at acknowledging those different heights. Like if you're crawling like a baby, this is what it looks like. Uh, and um, it was a beautiful time in my life because I felt like I was just beginning uh, like a baby to be a photographer. And it helped me, I think, to help me to clear certain ideas about what I think photography was, including it liberated a certain kind of imagination <laughs> for me. What, why, why can't I make a Chagall in front of my house? Um, so it was uh, not only liberating, but it opened up doors to certain closets that I had in me, and that could be a picture too. Why can't I wait for the shadow to be right? Um, after many, many, many pictures of childhood objects and things like that, I graduated to water. <laughs> Uh, really interesting time in my life, just being inside the house a lot with, with the kids and looking at, finding time to look at fairly ordinary things, things that could be considered boring, you know, water pouring out of a pot. Like a Zen almost test. Uh, I, I felt very encouraged by these meditations uh, where water can become all kinds of things and including optics. Um, a lot of, the, this is around 88, 89, a lot of what I was photographing at home began to be about cr rudimentary optics. The, the sense of how uh, even water can become a lens. The way that window in there is actually being seen by this could be Chablis or Chardonnay, it doesn't matter. Um, actually, it's water because I don't drink. And that led me to, to think about uh, other optical means, the, the way that my, I see the world, that if you wear glasses, you get this photograph. It's this, we have this artificial thing, device, that makes us be able to see. So um, these early experiments led to my trying to photograph what a camera it was. I was teaching at the time at a place called Massachusetts College of Art, and this is 1991. Oh, so before I show you that, this is not me. This is a Durer, maybe the greatest artist in the world ever. Anyway, a wonderful etching about the problem that most artists have uh, w to turn something three-dimensional into two dimensions. A photographer, a painter, uh, we have that task of, of sandwiching that 3D into 2D. And this is a beautiful uh, sense of that camera that uh, he's using. So I made a picture in 1991 of uh, the crudest camera I can think of, uh, mostly for my students. This is 1991 at the height of postmodernism. It's sort of like the Trump of photography. Um, uh, just uh, awful, awful time when people were saying, oh, photography's dead, uh, who cares, you know, just silly stuff. Anyway, I wanted to make pictures about, even about the nature of photography and how, m first of all, mysterious it is, how simple, mysterious, and wonderful the thing is. So it's the most of crude cameras. So Martini Rossi, 
uh, camera. I don't know if you're familiar with that excellent wine. Uh, so on purpose, I wanted something very low class, like you know, tape and. But that light bulb, indeed, is actually coming into a box, and this is photography. And uh, it was fun to to think that photography in itself could be a subject of photography. That led to uh, experiments with camera obscura. Um, in the 80s, late 87, 88, 89, I used to experiment in my classrooms at MassArt by turning classrooms, whole classrooms, into a camera obscura. And by now, you know that it's any room that's been darkened. I would put black plastic on the windows, put a small hole looking out, and Huntington Avenue would come in upside down in our classrooms. And of course, the savviest, most cynical student, they became like, you know, Jesus freaks. <laughs> uh, it was this amazing, oh my god. Uh, that sense of it, this phenomenon being such a, a powerful reminder of the physics of the world led me to make, try to make pictures of the event of a camera obscura. This is a very rough etching of it, but the idea is, again, a dark room with a small hole brings in images upside down. I had heard about this forever from art historians and other, other things, uh, but I had never seen a photograph of the thing itself a photograph of the event of a camera obscure. And that's what I thought would be interesting. And it took me a whole summer to figure out exposures, but this is the first one I made in 1991. A hole looking into our neighbors led to this, and it was just kind of magical. My son, my wife, and I looking at this fairly ordinary street, but it was, it was like the Grand Canal. Um, and it was a photograph of it. And that led to maybe other pictures, not maybe, for real, I decided to try to go to other places like New York and begin this sort of examination of ordinary rooms and not so ordinary rooms. But think of this. This, is, this image was created by a hole. It was not created by Microsoft, right? A hole. And, and the idea that that I, hole existed at the beginning of the world, a crack on some cave, limestone cave, could have produced upside down bison <laughs> easily. Um, it's part of the fun of this kind of work. This is, uh, I, as Teresa said, I, I, we immigrated to New York City in 1962 from Cuba. And this is me, my sister, my mother, and a cousin, 42nd Street when it wasn't Disney. Um, but I do remember thinking that as a young refugee in New York City, it was exciting as hell, but it was also like, oh my god, I'll never understand this, this sense of a place that we'll never understand. So if Freud were alive today, he would know that this is my sublimation <laughs> of that experience, you know, how to make New York mine, make it private. So um, that's my theory anyway. So that's one year, then another year. Paper has, well, it's a fascinating substance, but it's interested me for many, many years in, the, in its different facets, uh, including books. A, a El Greco book with a window light shining on it, reflecting Jesus and Mary as a negative. It's not something you wake up to and you think, I didn't want to do that today. I'm just, you see it. And I began to make pictures of books based on this book that revelations and in interesting discoveries that I thought it would make a couple, I ended up making 60 photographs of books. People would call me at that time, and friends, and they say, what are you up to? And I would say, I'm photographing books. And there was this silence, <laughs> like, I guess it's the most boring thing you could ever say. Oh, well, good luck, yeah, books. But 
In fact, if you start looking, there's an endless amount of stuff to do. Really straight stuff. I mean, view camera, a book, a window. Nothing weird about the techniques. A book damaged by water. I wanted to see at what point does a book not end up not being a book. <laughs> you know, the stretching of its life. It still feels like a book to me. A tale of two cities, the, um, lit from behind, so you get uh, both, both pages. This is a more recent. This is called a book in a book, but it's more it, informally called a pregnant book. <laughs> uh, I, I, the other day I gave a talk and I thought, I should probably find the father <laughs> at some point and photograph that, whatever that may be. <coughs> a photograph I made in, when Brady was young, but I remade it, of a book. Uh, but the way children read things, you know, <laughs> sort of all at once. And I wanted this almost like Mexican muralist approach to this fire engine book, the whole story in one, one shot. There's a guy named Frederick Sommer who I adore, and he did something like that with Durer books. Alice, another book. Um, I illustrated it for, for a, a publisher, and these are very low-end uh, cut out, paper cutouts of Alice and his stories. I actually drilled a dictionary. It was really fun to huge drill <laughs> through it, and as you're drilling these words and things coming out, right? And I'm, I'm telling, uh, I gave a talk at the MFA in Boston to third graders, fourth graders. And I'm like, yeah, and I'm drilling this book. And the teacher's like horrified because <laughs> it's like, well, no, he's an artist, you know. He's like, they do weird things. Like, oh my god, he's destroyed a book. Um, I'm trying to um, illustrate the, the second book, Through the Looking Glass, in a very radically different way. So. Um, Money is paper as well, very symbolic paper. So I've been fascinated by that too. One dollar, 25. It's a prototype, it's not quite been tried out yet. 60, 40,000. This is real money, by the way. <coughs> Seven million. I love the fact that it looks like something's been abandoned by some dock. You know, just, uh, and it, money smells too, smells a lot uh, when I was photographing. So that's seven million, this is 50 million. And it's all in my basement. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll give you the address uh, very soon. Um, I've, I've had access to the Federal Reserve in different cities over the years. So it's a very interesting thing to do because I asked them, that once I said fine, they said, well, how much do you want? I said, 100 million. Said, no, no fucking way. No, 100 million. 50. You know, okay, 50. <laughs> <laughs> it was like this weird conversation. 50, okay, we can deal with 50. So I said, okay, but can you do it in the shape of a Mexican pyramid? <laughs> <laughs> so in fact, my sister and I arrived there, and they were just finishing this pyramid. It's very interesting. I wish they could have videotaped this thing. 
so that's um, other paper interests of mine have been, well, ordinary things like paper bags and other paper constructions. My Picasso bag. We can also take a lot of Piranesi and people like that, illustrations where I actually would make books out of illustrations and then cut through them to reveal the underside of things, the, the, um, just the beneathness of things. So these little Piranesi made up constructions. Doré, purgatory. The Bible, it's pretty violent stuff. <laughs> Again, it's pages looking into inside pages, inside pages, in, like windows below, um, archaeologically almost. Jesus taking care of a storm. A, a time, this is really sacrilegious, but a time, a my bridge of the crucifixion, uh, uh, the, the stages of it. Again, all with cutouts. I'm buying a lot of five by seven cards, thousands of them, to make these constructions. And also to do my family. This is my son, Brady. <coughs> my daughter, Laura. My wife, Lisa, and me. And this is just me. Um, I love the fact that if you go to Staples, you can buy the equivalent of marble. <laughs> You know, you can use five by seven cards in that same sense, that same ambition. Some color, early colored pictures when I began to actually make camera obscures in color. This wonderful man who has the palazzo in front of the Salute, Salute in Venice. It's an incredible sight, just this view. Uh, he called me up, he said, I saw a picture of yours in London can I persuade you to, you know, fly you here and put you up and make a picture in my bedroom? And my joke is, no, I'm gonna be in Detroit, you know. It's just, <laughs> yeah, so like we're there, like the next afternoon or something. <laughs> and indeed, his room was really kind of an amazing view of Salute. In this case, now things technologically have changed. I have instead of a hall which is fairly crude and not so detailed, I began to get lenses made to sh focus at different distances, focal, length, focal lengths. So I had le like 10 lenses that I could focus the, in the right way so that things are very bright, very bright, very sharp, and the exposures at, that t at this time were still only five hours. But so this is the view from his room. So this Rococo interior, um, I really like the, the unzenness of this. Um, he also said, uh, this man, says, this is a kind of lento painting, by the way. He said, I know the guy who lives there. He actually said, looking at the painting, he said, yeah, I know this dude. He sells tires or something. It was like that. I was like, okay, well, you we should go there. I said, yeah, right on that floor. So I'm convinced that from that floor, looking at the Piazzetta, kind of let them make this painting. It had to be that, that height. So I made a picture in it with a new, improved, not maybe not improved, but a changed technology. I can make things right side up now. So... I know some people are, I, I get hate email, like, camera obscures are upside down, what the hell are you doing? You know, they get very upset with tradition, whatever that is, because I'm making them. Um, so this is 
still a five hour exposure, but now things can be in color, sharp, and dry side up. In Venice too, the house of a Colombian woman who had a palazzo by the canal, but she decided to decorate her whole interior in the Colombian jungle motif. So with, talk about who needs Magritte? The canal meeting Colombia? Also been interested in photographing art as a, as a way to, well, well you'll see. Uh, I was an artist in residence at Yale uh, a few years ago. And I, I proposed that I could, if I could get some art moved in front of other art. Curators didn't like this in particular. Uh, in fact, I was surrounded by them. <laughs> because that Nadelman head was very close to that hopper. Uh, but I wanted to be a curator of a kind to make something like that happen. A real life Photoshop. You know, how to create a new hybrid of from Nadelman to Hopper becomes uh, the Kiriko. Some recent New York pictures. That's not recent, that's <laughs> 1963, my family. We went to Central Park, Park a lot. And that arrow points to the Plaza Hotel, which to us was like a million miles away as these young refugee families. I'm just pointing that out because I, a few years ago, someone who actually had a, a place at the Plaza said, you know, I have a really interesting view of the, of the park. Would you like to photograph there? And like, like a lot of New York apartments, a lot of people don't go there anymore. <laughs> they just exist. So I was able to make uh, four views. This is spring time, summer, fall, and winter. And it was um, the first time I've tried that, the idea. Well, being able to actually have access to this place was really useful, because any time I wanted to go, I could go there. But that idea of a, a view that kept changing throughout. This is at the World Trade Center now. I think it's called Freedom Tower or Freedom Fries. I forgot what. Some recent, also recent New York camera obscures. I made this picture, uh, it was a 6 a.m. sunrise on Manhattan, and I was really satisfied. I was ready to have lunch and then drive back to Boston. And when I came back, I noticed that the lights had changed enough to merit uh, another picture, which is actually a better <laughs> picture. You never know. And now, Okay, here's a, the big, big change is that now instead of having film, uh, so I'm using a diopter, very sharp, very bright. I'm using a digital te technology, so from five hour exposures to five minutes, even less, up sometimes a minute. So the idea of those clouds, unthinkable before. Now because of technology, uh, it, it really helps to capture moments. It's as if, you know, Watkins traded his um, wet plate for dry plate. A lot of people think, digital, oh, the devil, you know. It's technology, it's what, what photography has been about all these years. And in fact, th this set of pictures points to that sense of being able to get light. This is a morning view of the bridge. That same day, an afternoon one, in the evening, impossible before. So I love this new ability to make uh, quick exposures. These are just still lives, so I don't, I don't know what to say about them. Etc. 
except time is passing. <laughs> and I've become a kind of a painter. I mean, I'm, I'm, I really, I'm not a painter, but I'm using paint now. So this is a little bit of a tribute to, this is my boy brush and my lady brush. <laughs> yes, I don't know. I'm probably going to be sued for this. Okay, this is um, more or less what I've been doing for uh, a few years. Um, this is um, a, a, an optical device, camera lucida, that was very much in vogue before photography was invented. And it was, it's a very difficult mach device to use. It's a stick with a prism, and if you hold it just right, you can see the mountains and the piece of paper beneath you. If you do it right, you can actually trace those mountains well. It's kind of a weird device. In the hands of someone inept, like Fox Talbot, the inventor of photography, you get crap, <laughs> right? In the hands of someone who knew how to use it, like his, friends, his friend Herschel, look at that. And it's a good thing that we got crap out of this guy, <laughs> because Fox Talbot said basically, I want to keep that image that I was seeing in my camera obscured. I want to invent photography. If he had done that, it would oh, I'm a genius. I'm, who needs photography? So um, around the time of the camera lucida, all kinds of weird other devices were used by artists before photography. So this um, was very much in vogue to this periscope-like thing that would project an image of the landscape onto your, your paper. Then you can draw it and trace it and fine. So uh, I got a commission to photograph in West Texas a number of years ago. They wanted to make, make camera obscure pictures in the desert. I said, well, there's no chalets here in the <laughs> desert. Uh, it's a desert. So I thought, well, maybe I can invent a kind of a traveling room where this thing could work. So it took me a bit to get this going, uh, but that is essentially what it does. It's got a huge tripod with a periscope looking at the world. It projects whatever image it is onto the ground, whatever the ground is, and I make a picture of it. This is uh, our first experiment in Big Bend National Park. It's a wonderful place. Nobody goes there because it's so far away. But this is our sort of a first experiment there. Uh, and it was a pain in the ass. It really was like Watkins and O'Sullivan and just, <laughs> oh my god. And, and when it's hot, it's just impossible. Anyway, that tent eventually got set up to look at this unremarkable piece of land. And, and this is the picture that got made. And it was very interesting because now the ground has something to say. An image is actually on the ground, and uh, it's this, new, this hybrid of events. So this is also in Big Bend. El Capitan. I mean, it's, it's a way to revisit all those famous pictures by you name them including Ansel Adams, and to make them my own. This is a, a wonderful uh, William Henry Jackson picture. Perhaps the first photograph, Doug and Maria could probably correct me, but uh, probably one of the earliest photographs of All Faithful ever made. And, I, and you know how many billions of pictures are, are there of that now. So I wanted to make my own, so I got access to, some people were asking me if I, you, I didn't know you could camp here. <laughs> it was a, well, special, you know. Um, but I love that I'm trying to revisit these iconic places and make them my own, like that Times Square picture. So this is the result. Uh, Maine. 
dead grass, the bubble mountain. Very much like a painting. The Grand Canyon. Cathedral Rock, this is a, uh, you could really still almost hear Ansel talking. What the hell are you doing photographing this sacred place? Yellowstone in the winter. <laughs> Talk about sacrilegious. <laughs> this is an, <laughs> you know, a sacred place looking at the baptistry. The reason I wanted to photograph the baptistry is because uh, Brunelleschi demonstrated his perspective, uh, so it, people say, there. And uh, if, uh, Western art changed from that moment on. So I like the idea of visiting a place that was so important in visuality, outskirts of Florence. New York City, rooftops that I'm hoping to go back to. This is a tent picture of, of the Manhattan Bridge. Small little project that I have that I want to continue, but um, abandoned places that I, Boston has been kind enough to let me in, places that are scheduled for demolition. So this is a place that I found. So I brought in a, a little a team of people, and I made this to photograph sort of alter the interior of a place in a way that it changes it. And this is an abandoned place by hoarders that I painted half black. Creepy stuff. Because you're walking around and don't know what organic stuff is there. But it was really fun to just kind of say, from the right, the right part, it's like a Dutch landscape, a Dutch interior. This is all sprayed black, like a horror movie. And still lives that have made in these abandoned places. OK, sorry, that's a lot of work. You OK? <laughs> I went to Giverny two, two Mays ago. I was uh, an artist in residence at the Terra Foundation. And the garden where Monet painted was right next door. And I thought, ah, you think I could put my tent in here and make a picture of the gardens? And I said, fine. So this is my assistant and I in, in Monet's garden. After the tour is gone, you, you have to wait for that. And uh, this is the first picture that came out. And it blew my mind, because the pebbles on the ground made the thing impressionistic. <laughs> this is a straight picture. This is not Photoshop. It's what we saw. And it felt like this confluence of impressionism and photography coming together. So I made, we made a few others. That's a painter, a, a painter, a uh, gardener posing for me. This is almost like a male Nolda, you know, just very weird German expressionism. Wheelbarrow on the garden at 6 a.m. The Seine nearby. Our second trip, I wanted to make more pictures a la Monet by going in to other places, not just the garden. But this is a late afternoon light on the garden. A gardener on the main path with the house back there. Uh, early in the morning in the garden, it looks, to me, it's like the Barbizon school. It's like 
Kokoro went to Rouen Cathedral where Monet actually made 30, 31 paintings of this facade. And we put the tent in front of the cathedral. Then we found an apartment across the cathedral, abandoned uh, by I don't know who, but we got access to it. So we s made some camera obscuras of the facade inside this really abandoned place. So that's 11 a.m. 2 p.m. 5 p.m. I didn't do 30, um, but I wanted to have a sense of it, durational time in front of this cathedral. Poplars by the River Dieppe. Um, this is by the Normandy coast. Etretat, well-known site with a lonely cloud. Okay, I'll do that somewhere in there. Then we went to Paris to make some camera obscure pictures. This is uh, where Monet actually took his train to go to Giverny. This is a camera obscure picture. Another camera obscura in looking at City Hall. This is in a very weird picture in a rich guy's apartment. I don't know how else to say it. This is all Hermes curtains that go for miles. So you can think, you know, $2,000 for a little scarf, you know. Um, but Invalide happened to be near him, so I love the balloons and Invalide, and it's just like, it's like a Fellini uh, thing. And then on the other side was this. He also had a nice porch outside where we could put the tent. The, t por the porch was, had uh, tiles, you know, blue and, and black and white. Feels like the bottom is like Aceh's France or something. <laughs> the other stuff is like now. I want to end with this series. Uh, it's a series called Flowers for Lisa uh, that I started a year and a half, two years ago. It, it was my wife's birthday, and I was going to buy her some flowers, like I usually do. And I thought, OK, I'm going to buy some flowers, and I'm going to make some pictures, a picture of it to give to her. It's a way of getting everybody get everybody's happy. And I thought I would make something I've never done before, like multiple exposures with digital technology. And what that involved was getting a vase, and I bought a lot of flowers, put a little bouquet, just one, take a picture of it, not move anything else, take that bouquet out, put another one, take a picture, 20 times. And it happens that when you, in traditional photography, when you put two negatives, two, two exposures together, you get a composite. You know, if you have a face on a mountain, you kind of get your face in the mountain. But if it's really complicated, it negates darkness, negates darkness, and it's not so easy. In Photoshop, which is what we have now instead of an enlarger, when you ask Photoshop, okay, put these 20 different pictures together, it, it's like putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. It doesn't quite know what it was, what it is, what it should be. So between what I like, by liking certain flowers, by keeping that file there or not, well, you get a weird, weird hybridness. So um, it, 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 it took about half an hour for Photoshop to put it together, and we were like, okay. And then this thing came out. I was like, oh, what is that? <laughs> is it photography? Is it painting? Is it watercolor? It was amazing. So, so it's, this one is the same technique. 
and I've begun to make pictures of flowers, not just in this technique, but a painting in Philadelphia, multiple exposures that creates a new painting. These are all called flowers for Lisa, by the way. Or being a real primitive, <laughs> this is clay. Flower stems. This is really vulgar, and it's just lots of multiple exposures of flowers. This is my Elizabethan mortuary. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Just the idea of death and uh, melancholy. I've been spraying flowers with black and gray and white. Dry flowers, a lot of them, over a week, painting them, stepping on them, taking them out, creating a kind of a ground that's weird, like, like the side of a, the edge of a pond. Why does, why does a vase need to be a vase? <laughs> and this is where I'm beginning to actually paint on wood. I painted that vase, and I also painted the background, and I put multiple exposures of flowers. So you get this weird interaction between painting and photography, it's this crazy new, again, hybrid. I'm going to end with three pictures uh, that were made last week. The last one was made yesterday. But I wanted to have a, a triptych of a kind of, with two vases, two vases creating this world. So that's number one. Number two. And this is the one that we made yesterday. As flowers die and they get painted by me and you get a, a weird new sense of continuity and death. Thank you for coming. If you have any questions, I, I don't know, I'll try to answer. Foucault or F-stops or whatever, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> just raise your hand and, or just say them. Wow. It's all digital. Yeah, yeah, I've been doing digital since, but it's not like I'm putting unicorns up there, you know. Uh, it, it, very straight. It's a digital camera, very high end, 100 megapixels. And I'm photographing it like a view camera. So it's, yeah. Yes? How, how large? Yeah. Uh, I can make these uh, 45 by 60, yeah. uh, even a little bit larger. And they, they really hold up. It, it feels like film or better. So I'm sorry? Something like that, but I think some smaller. I don't know. Uh, you want one now, so we can. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we have microphones up here if anybody wants. Well, to I can hear them. Anybody else? No, uh, yes. So you started off by lamenting postmodernism when you started your career. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Okay.
With theory? Yeah. No, I, I, no, I think theory is, you know, like people say, it's, um, art history is to art like ornithology is to birds. Uh, no, I, I, I don't, I, yes, I'll read stuff, but I, I'm interested in my own consumption of pleasure. Um, that's what drives me. Yes, I mean, the idea of something being represented in very different ways is, is like a Wallace Stevens poem, too. You know, a blackbird can be lots of different things. Um, so uh, I don't know if, I don't know what you mean by theory. Well, I mean, the, you know, the, the basic foundation for how representation works would be the fascinating theory, the elemental aspects of picture making. Well, because to me, photography is all about that. It's not what I see, it's what the camera sees. And that's always been, to me, welcome news, even when it's boring. It's always interesting. And that continues to me. The way that um, when we make a print of this, I go, oh my god, I, I didn't notice that. And, um, and I'm not, and also not trying to be uh, ironic. I mean, I hope. I mean, I'm, they're beautiful, I think. But, yeah, I, but all of them have to do with the sense of space. The, the space in my pictures is huge. It's a huge concern. You know, perspective being altered. Uh, this is techie stuff, but these are five different vases in this deep. And each vase is at an angle, so that flowers back there are here. So it's all, but I'm using a very long lens, a telephoto lens, which compresses it. So I hope psychologically you sense that something is wrong here in terms of the elevation, but it's not wink, wink. It's, it's an optical illusion of a kind, uh, I hope. Come on, no Marxist questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, about the color selection, it, when you are thinking through the process of putting together the composition, is color something you think of first, or do you work on it as it progresses, I suppose? The color changes? You mean the flowers? Yes. We buy a lot of flowers. <laughs> and I have an assistant who's really good at, I don't care, you know. She says, I think this will go together, but um, my biggest fun is spraying them. <laughs> because I, I like transforming things. Um, but, um, for instance, I mean, the second one was sprayed with white. You still get colors throughout. The third one was sprayed with black, and you still get colors through it. I mean, if, if I had all the time in the world, I would wait a year and see what happens to that thing, but I need to use my camera for something else, so. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh -oh. oh, sorry. <laughs> Somebody else? Oh. Hi. Um, okay, I have two questions. One, my strategy for taking photos is to take a million. Do you have any better advice on how to take a good photo other than two million. quantity? <laughs> and then uh, also, secondly, process seems to be really important to you. I feel like maybe some photographers seek like the perfect moment, but it seems that you curate your moment. So can you talk about your process and how you like align the thing that you photograph? We, we, we spend a lot, I mean, now that I'm photographing a lot inside, and digitally, so there's a lot of pictures I make. And then I live with it for like a day, and I keep looking at it, and I was like, I don't sleep, and then, of course, we need something else there. So slowly, over two or three days, the picture gets shaped. But then in the middle of the night, I'll think, hell, I should just spray it black. So, Is that sculpture? Sculpture? I, I don't, you know what, I don't care. I'm <laughs> making art. But it is kind of a, an obsession that I, I love having at this age. Uh, but it is a pain in the ass with others because my wife f finds my obsessions a little, like in the middle of the night, spraying down there. <laughs> but I am driven to make, uh, flowers are such a, it's a hard subject because so they've used forever and they, they tend to be kitsch, you know. Uh, so I'm trying to make pictures that have been made before, but hopefully in a, in a new way, like the, you know, the, the Geyser picture. Um, 
I, I, and I, I just, it's true, flowers really represent death and closeness and hope and sex and, and intimacy and you can just keep naming things. And so it's, I love being able to use this subject as a kind of a, a pretext to also be a little wild. Because I tend, in my young age, I used to be kind of very controlling, Mondrian type. And now it feels like I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the way things want to be. And it's, it, it feels very nice to, to let that happen. Sort of the way my children are now, just you know, okay, whatever, you know, just you want to do that, cool. Um, so it, I think it's part of my growth to to deal with flowers as a an emerging organism of a kind, and I think an emerging consciousness in my my way too. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you.